don't know about you, but hearing that Christmas music gets me all warm and fuzzy. Good morning, Williams. Good morning, good morning. It's good to see you all here on our first Sunday of Advent. I have a few announcements to make. So listen up. Some of you grabbed your bulletin as you walked in. So look on with me. This Wednesday, I will meet with the children. Um, at 6 o'clock, we're going to do a mission project for our homebound. And um, speaking of homebound, we have a lot of those that are unable to visit our services. They have to watch online through Facebook. And you know what? They miss us. They miss being here. And we miss them. So I want us to work together this Christmas season to um, get in touch with those people. Send them Christmas cards. Give them calls. Um, because it's just an unusual time when we are usually together and we can't be so much. So keep them in mind this Christmas season. Um, there was a family that lost their home to a fire uh, this past week, the Elm Road family, and they are in need of everything. So if you would like to help with that family, we are collecting gift cards for them. Um, and you may get those gift cards. Can we get it to you, Allison? Or money. Hey, gift cards or money for the family. Also still in need of water bottles for the elementary and high school students. Uh, in the bulletin, there's the list of the Gamecock Marketplace. And even though there's no students actually in school right now for Christmas, there's a lot that are living on campus or in the community in there. It's still in need of these uh, items. So you can get those to the marketplace or have them sent here. And Emily Duncan will get them shipped there. And as you can see, we're really low in numbers. There's a lot of people in quarantine this morning and unable to be here. So just remember to stay safe and stay six feet apart, wear your mask if you can. And then choir practice. Right after the service, you have a big Christmas event coming next Sunday morning. So you need to do some practicing first. So right after the service, you will have choir practice. All righty, let's begin first with a wave or a smile. Find someone to, to wave at. Or yawn, yawn. <laughs> it's good to see you all here this morning, it really is. So let's have a time of prayer. Please pray with me. God, thank you for getting us all here this morning safely. We thank you for this place and the reason that we come. We are so thankful for you. We love you and all that you have done for us and continue to do. May we always sing your praises through the good and bad. I ask your blessings on this service, hanging of the green, as we decorate our sanctuary for Christmas, for Advent. But there, it is more than just decorations. There's meaning behind each piece. A meaning of a child in a manger who came to save the world. Thank you so much. It's in your name we pray. Amen. As we begin the Christian year, we also celebrate the holy season known as Advent. It is a time when we prepare ourselves for the coming of our Messiah. Advent means arrival. We celebrate these days of Advent in expectation and preparation for Christ's arrival. Through centuries, Christians have observed a time of waiting and expectation before celebrating the birth of the Savior at Christmas. The Advent season is a time for reflection and preparation, but its mood is joyful. Advent has been enriched by Christian tradition to reflect its distinctive Christian meaning. It proclaims the revelation of God's love as expressed in child's birth in a humble stable, his sacrificial death on the cross, his victorious resurrection. It points to the hope of Christ coming again as King of kings and Lord of lords. Advent makes innkeepers out of all of us. 
asking each of us to make room for the arrival of Christ the King. Let us today prepare him room in our hearts, our lives, and our homes. Some captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile here until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, ye shall come to you, O Israel. O come, O wisdom from on high, who ordered all things mightily. To us the path of knowledge show, and teach us in its ways to go. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to you, O Come, O oh bright and morning star, and bring us comfort from afar. Dispel the shadows of the night, and turn our darkness into light. O oh, come, O oh, King of nations, bind in one the hearts of all mankind. Bid all our sad divisions cease and be yourself our King of Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to you, O the sanctuary evergreens. The most striking and the most universal feature of Christmas is the use of evergreens in churches and homes. Among ancient Romans, evergreens were an emblem of peace, joy, and victory. The early Christians placed them in their windows to indicate that Christ had entered the home. Holly and ivy, along with pine and fir, are called evergreens because they never change color. They are ever green, ever alive, even in the midst of winter. They symbolize the unchanging nature of our God, and they remind us of the everlasting life that is ours through Christ Jesus. Under Christian thought and sentiment, holly became widely used in church celebrations. Holly was considered as the burning bush, or a symbol of Mary, whose being glows with the Holy Spirit. The red berries represented the blood drops from the cruel thorns in the crown of Jesus. In Isaiah 60, 13, we find these words. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto you, the fir tree, the pine tree, and the box together to beautify the place of your sanctuary.
Amen. Let's all join in the worship and lift our voices. You can stand as we sing this great hymn of the season. All the words will be on the screen. God bless all of you joining us on Facebook today. I want you to sing along, okay? Let's sing it. Go tell it on the mountain. Today, the Christmas tree is the center of our festivities. Glittering with lights and ornaments, it is a part of the beauty and meaning of Christmas. There are several legends and stories about the Christmas tree. The first use of the Christmas tree was in the medieval German paradise plays, held outdoors and portraying the creation of humankind. The tree of life was a fir tree decorated with apples. Later, other ornaments were hung upon them, such as paper flowers and gilded nuts. In England, branches or whole trees were forced into bloom indoors for Christmas. From these beginnings, the use of a Christmas tree at Christmas was established. Most Christmas greenery reflect European traditions, but one colorful plant, which looks like a flaming star, the poinsettia, is native to the American continent. It was named after Dr. Joel Robin Poinsett, I'm sorry, Robert Poinsett, an ambassador to Mexico who first introduced it to the United States in 1828. The people of Mexico and Central America called the brilliant tropical plant of the flower of the holy night, the poinsettia, is a mini pointing star that has become a symbol of the star of Bethlehem. You can remain seated, but I want you to continue in the singing. Oh, come, all oh, ye faithful.
sing that last verse. Yea, Lord, we greet thee. Yea, Lord, we greet thee. For this happy morning, Jesus, to thee be all glory give. Word of the Father, God in flesh time of expectation and this is symbolized not only by the four-week period of preparation but also by the lighting of an advent calendar candle in an advent wreath on each Sunday of the season the flame of each new candle reminds us the worshipers that something is happening and something more is still to come the candles are arranged in a circle to remind us of the continuous power of God which knows neither beginning nor ending. There is no symbolism. There is also symbolism in the colors of the candles. The four purple candles symbolize the coming of Christ from the royal line of David. He is coming as the King of Kings as well as the Prince of Peace. The large white candle in the center is known as the Christ candle and points to Jesus as the Christ, the light of the world. A progression is noted in the lighting of the candles of the Advent wreath each Sunday. Each candle symbolizes various aspects of our waiting experience. The culmination of the season comes as we light the Christ candle on Christmas Eve evening. We join in rejoicing that the promise of long ago has been fulfilled. Today is the first Sunday of Advent in which we recall the hope we have in Christ. God told Abraham that through him all the nations of the world would be blessed because he trusted and put his hope in God. The Old Testament spoke of the coming of Christ, of how a savior would be born, a king in the line of, da of King David, and he would rule the world wisely and bless all the nations. We too believe in God's promise to send Jesus again to this world to establish his kingdom upon the earth. Hope is like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at the light of this candle, we celebrate the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Probably my favorite uh, Christmas song would be this one here. It tells an incredible true story. I would encourage you to to go and look the, the story up of the, the fellow who wrote this song. But one of my favorites, let's stand as we sing I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. Peace on Earth. I thought how as the 
good news. Then One of the most heartwarming expressions of Christmas is the Nativity. The Nativity speaks of the mystery of God's wisdom. Why God chose to send His Son into our world as a baby of humble birth, born in common surroundings, we do not know. What we do know is that God reached out to all people, including the poor and wealthy, the simple and the wise, the powerless and the powerful. All who found Him knelt in humility before Him. Whenever we see a Nativity, we find ourselves with Mary and Joseph with the shepherds and the, with the wise men, bowing before the manger, overwhelmed by God's expression of love in coming to us. Today we display a nativity in our sanctuary, in the center of our worship space, to remind us of who we should always worship when we gather in this space, and to focus our attention on this season and his birth. The greatest gift of Christmas is the gift of God in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> All that we do during this holy, se holy season points to that expression of holy love. Christ came as a babe in Bethlehem, God's gift at Christmas. As Christians, we seek to pass our heritage on to our children and to those who, by faith in Christ, become part of the family of God. It is through the work of the Holy Spirit in your life and mine that that gift goes on. Thank you to all of those who read and helped prepare our sanctuary space this past week. If you would, please read along with me in the 13th chapter of Mark, starting at verse 24. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert. For you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake. You do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or at cockcrow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he suddenly comes. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. May God bless the reading of God's holy word. Please pray with me. Loving God, may your words be heard, not mine. And may those words change us to further your kingdom. Amen. So being the oldest 
of the grandchildren. As a teenager, I was often given the responsibility to watch over the younger cousins. So one afternoon in particular, the adults left me in charge while they attended a funeral. But before my babysitting duties, I visited the medicine cabinet. I was suffering from the common cold and thought that some over-the-counter medication would weaken my runny nose and cough. And I was going to be chasing these children around, these five hyperactive children. I needed to be at my best. And you know what it's like when cousins get together. It's total mayhem, or at least it is at my house. So it was important to be at my best both mentally and physically. No cold could get me down. So just minutes after the adults said their goodbyes and I was officially on the clock, my eyelids began to droop and then the muscles throughout my body reduced in speed. My neck and legs and arms moved as if in slow motion. You know that feeling. Immediately, I knew what I had done. I recklessly ingested some nighttime cold medication. And it was too late. But I had to fight the urge to sleep. I was in charge. Standing, it helped for a little bit, but... I would eventually sway myself into sleep. And I tried moving around the house, encouraging the kids to move with me, making a game of it. But they decided on a quiet game of Candyland. Those ice cream slopes and gumdrop mountains could not keep my attention for long. I eventually allowed my head to just lean back against the wall ever so softly and let the diphenhydramine take over. Now, although that day I gladly accepted my babysitting fees, I did not deserve it. I was not able to stay alert. No matter what I tried, the slumber advanced and I, the person left in charge, was totally unaware of my surroundings or any safety precautions. But yet the most unfortunate part of it all was that that precious time that I dearly cherish with my cousins it was neglected. I missed out that day. Now, on this first Sunday of Advent, the church starts a new liturgical year. We begin with a season of preparation, expectation for the coming of our Lord's glory and power. With the excitement of singing Christmas carols and decking the halls here in our sanctuary, we're met with this unexpected apocalyptic text from the Gospel of Mark. Now, this is why I prefer to look to the lectionary readings. We're compelled to examine those challenging scriptures that we might otherwise ignore or just pass by. And a message of Advent, it's, it's found in these verses, though. But it's set within the middle of Christ's passion narrative. So beginning in verse 11... I mean, in chapter 11, Jesus starts to reveal himself as being the very temple and living presence of God. And this idea it is communicated in the following four chapters. So, you know, we know the story. Jesus enters into Jerusalem. He is uh, declared by the crowd, son of David. He proclaims his divine incarnate identity in the temple through teachings. He curses the fig tree. He speaks of the parable of the vineyard. And then he announces the rejection of the cornerstone. Now these events are established to challenge the hypocrisy of the religious leaders of the time, the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and Herodians. But here in chapter 13, where we read today, the setting and the audience changes. Jesus, he's no longer among the large crowds in the city, but he's with his inner circle of friends, the disciples. And Peter, James, John, Andrew, they have some questions, as anyone would who hears Jesus prophesy these things to come, a temple destruction and false prophets and chaos among the nations. And then in the text that we read, 
Jesus begins to warn of the suffering that will happen and the darkening of the sun and the moon not giving light, the powers of heaven shaken. Pretty scary stuff. These words, they lack the motivation to get us in the mood to sing some Christmas carols, Joy to the World, or Santa Claus is Coming to Town. So where is the message of anticipation and peace? Well, if we look in verse 31, Jesus says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. This promise, it expresses the very heart of our faith. The reason we as a community of Christ emphasize hope and love during this time of year. The fears of today, the turmoil and confusion of our lives, it will pass on. What is to come is far greater. Jesus has come. Jesus is present now and will come again. Three different times, Jesus advises us, beware, keep alert, keep awake. In his final words to us in verse 32, he says, But about the day or hour no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. And then following these words, Jesus delivers the parable of the doorkeeper, where the slaves and the doorkeeper eagerly wait for their master's return, or at least they should be. The call to watchfulness for the Messiah's coming is the gift of this text for us. It's easy to become complacent with the mundane customs of this season. We allow the mindless frenzy to dull that illustrious shine of our preparation of the coming Christ. But there is more. There is better. But we have to be observant. We do not want to miss out this Advent season. We do not know the day or hour. Therefore, we must live in mindfulness of a future beyond human knowing. So let us stay awake and keep alert for Christ this season. Let's pray. Heavenly God, we thank you for your words this morning. We ask your help. Help us. Encourage us, push us to stay alert, to keep awake for you this season. Let us not miss out. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Now that we're all standing in an alert stance, I want to challenge you. A few weeks ago, we had a friend from the Center of Healthy Churches, Bill Owen, come to speak. And one thing that he said that we as a church should do is pray as a whole together. So I challenge you to take 40 days and pray. And you might have already snatched one of these. Great. If you haven't, do so as you leave today. With the help of Bill, you have 40 days of um, a scripture devotion to lead you in that prayer time. So take it, accept the challenge, and let's pray together for 40 days. Let's pray. Lord, keep us alert for you. And when we set our eyes upon you, let us act. God's will. Nothing more, nothing else, nothing less. Amen.